As dawn breaks over Johannesburg, the busiest city centre in Africa hums to life as hundreds and thousands of South Africans stream into the city to chase their piece of the golden dream. Thanks to a vibrant revitalization effort over the past couple of years, the Johannesburg CBD is the vital centre of life for the many who study, work and play there. And now, Clinix's first day hospital is right in the heart of the CBD to help sustain and enhance that life. So Clinix has got the longest history in the country of providing a platform for black professionals in particular to be able to deliver care in the private sector. And our, one, our oldest hospital in the group, Dr. S.K. Matseke, has been doing this since 1985 and uh, we have got a uh, great experience and we have got a large uh, a network of uh, specialists across uh, our facilities who are highly skilled uh, in the different uh, disciplines of, uh, of medicine. We are really uh, in a very good position to be able to make those uh, skills and expertise available to the communities and, uh, and the people who work and live in and around the job CBD. For more than 30 years, the Clinics Group has been striving to identify opportunities and meaningful ways to pay tribute to our founding fathers, who epitomized the concept of black excellence from the start. And it is in tribute to these visionaries that this hospital is named after the astute businessman and legal expert, Dr. G.M. Bikia. Dr. Bikia was, uh, to me, it was very, very special. Uh, from the home front, uh, he was my father's best friend. And uh, there would never be any important uh, occasion happening at home without uh, Dr. Peter being there. So he's always been there. Uh, at, at some stage in my life, I went through difficult times. He was there for me. You know, when I went through my difficult times, he was there to listen for me. When he went through his difficult times, when he had cancer, I was there to look after him. So I, I've got that special relationship with him. He, he, he's, a, he's a community leader to me, he's my father to me, he's, he's everything. The founding fathers, like him, is Dr. PJ, but actually he was a lawyer. Okay. Dr. Tato Matlana was a doctor, but a businessman. Dr. Mukhesi was a doctor, visionary, a businessman as well. In, what, in whatever they did, they were quite diverse. Possibly, if you look into his contribution in law, you'll find that it's major. Uh, he was the first president of, of uh, Black Lawyers Association. If you went into education, you'll find that he also features in education. So they, they, were, sp they were a special breed of people that worked across their disciplines. The Dr. G. M. Bigge Day Hospital at 56 Von Willer Street in the heart of Joburg offers healthcare services in dentistry, dermatology, optometry, ophthalmology, physiotherapy, audiology, ear, nose and throat surgery, orthopedics, gynecology, pediatrics, maxillofacial surgery, as well as general elective surgery. We have a variety of specialities here at, at Dr. J.M. Peche, the hospital, and they range from your dentistry, your general surgeon, your pediatrician, gynecologist, and many more. What uh, clinics actually means to me is that uh, it, it, uh, majority of the time, uh, it talks about uh, black excellence. I believe I'm young, I'm black, I'm educated, and I fit right in, in clinics. I am really honored to be part of this project. Um, you know, clinics, their mission resonates with me. Um, they are about uh, providing affordable and quality healthcare for the people. And that's, that's, that, that really does it for me. It's nice in a way, because you, you're not just in Soweto, in a, in a facility that's substandard. They have top class facilities. Uh, we are able to practice what we do uh, with the best that you find out uh, in the best facilities in the world. Our hospital is a 36 bedded hospital. However, we've got our three state of the art theaters that we are going to use to do our elective surgeries. 
The 36 beds in the state-of-the-art wards and private rooms provide a safe and comfortable space for patients to recover from same-day surgeries under expert supervision. The facility also offers doctor suites for consultations with GPs and specialists for all who work and live in the city. For the convenience of all its patients, the Dr. G.M. Bikye Day Hospital offers safe and secure parking and the use of a courtesy shuttle service for patients who need to be transported between other clinics' facilities. You know, the business of clinics has always been to take care of the previously, historically underprivileged uh, people. And uh, we know that uh, our city centres are full of such people. Our city centres are now full of people from outside our borders, uh, from uh, 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 the, the Africa, the north of, uh, of, of where we are. And um, those people have not have had that, uh, they, they, they haven't had that, uh, the privilege of having the facility like the clinics, the hospital uh, uh, that is coming up now. So this is going to be a fantastic uh, service for, for all of them. And uh, we hope that um, the people will uh, see the advantage of, uh, um, you know, being serviced close to their, where they are. I think that's the whole idea of clinics, to serve people closest to where they live. It is this ethos of excellence that provides a haven of health care for the denizens of Africa's busiest city. The Dr. G.M. Bikye Day Hospital at 56 Von Willer Street in the heart of Josie is open to all every day of the week from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and welcomes all medical aids. And it serves as a fitting memorial to a remarkable man who dedicated his life to excellence. Hi, Zogi. Hi, Dr. Pila. We are ready. Yeah, you missed that. So I was disconnected yeah. because of blue shading. No problem. So, you can go ahead. Okay. So, so good evening, colleagues. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Raymond Pila. Sorry, load shading. I was disconnected and I, I didn't know whether we had started or right because I was, I was connected when we started. I just wish to welcome you, uh, all of you, once more to our weekly webinars. Uh, hosted by Clinics Health Group. And as usual, these are CPD accredited uh, presentations uh, uh, by various speakers. And uh, also note that the presentations are recorded live on YouTube. So if you miss out on this presentation, so you want to go back to the presentations, you're quite at, at liberty to go back and access our YouTube link, which will be provided to you at the end of the presentation, so hopefully by tomorrow morning. And that these webinars are CPD accredited. And so if you're registered with HPSSA, you don't have to send your details after this. But once you're registered, we'll submit your uh, registration to the HPSSA so that they can allocate your CPD points. And also remember that when you log in, please make sure that you mute yourself and you also switch off your video so that we have a better streaming or reception. Uh, this evening, we are quite delighted to be joined by a very young uh, professional, uh, Dr. Zakia Gaby, who is uh, currently working at Chris and Barokanath Hospital as a medical officer, but with a special interest in, in, in urology. I was talking to her that she's waiting for her turn to be registered as a specialist and get your uh, registration uh, get going. But then she qualified at Vets University in 2015 and did two years at the beautiful town of George, where she enjoyed working there. 
uh, George Hospital in the Western Cape. And she returned back to Joburg and joined Helen Joseph Hospital for community service. And I think that's where she um, 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 met Professor Adam, who's the head of, who was the head of uh, urology at Helen Joseph, must have encouraged her to continue to study and specialize in urology. Thereafter, she worked at the, uh, that department for six months with Professor Adam. And then later on, uh, Dr. Gaby has a keen interest in neurology and geology oncology. She has completed primaries and intermediate exams and has been part of the team to start probably a brachytherapy at Professor Dibara. And she has lately stopped doing her outpatient service uh, where she left her colleagues who are busy with the clinic at the moment at Professor Dibara to come and do a presentation and talk to us about late onset hypogonadism. When she spoke to us initially, she spoke about uh, this as male menopause. So I'm excited to hear from you, Dr. Gabby. Uh, thanks, welcome uh, to Clinics uh, Weekly webinars and we get to have you to speak to us on this topic. Thank you, Dr. Bila. So as uh, Dr. Bila has said, I'm Sukia. I'm one of the medical officers currently working at Chris Hani Baragona. Um, today, we're going to be talking about late onset hypogonadism. This is just an outline of the talk for today. Um, so the definition of late onset hypogonadism um, is a clinical yeah, and biochemical syndrome. Hi, can you it hear does. me? Yeah, I can hear you if you can just do a slideshow. Oh, is it not sharing? It, it is sharing, but if you can just uh, go to a slideshow. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Let me just try and... Um, let's just see here. Yeah, just stick from the beginning, yes, sure. Here we go. Is it better now? Is it a slideshow now, Dr. Bila? Um, no, but we can so. continue, it's fine. That's not here, but it's fine oh. if we can see yeah. Oh, sorry. It seems to be a slideshow on my side. Let me just try one more time. Uh, I think, okay. No, I don't think that's working. Let's just go. No, that's no, fine. We can proceed. Thing. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is just the outline of the talk. Um, so the definition is uh, late onset hypogonadism is a clinical and biochemical syndrome associated with advancing age. It's characterized by symptoms and a deficiency in serum testosterone levels in a person who has had normal pubertal development and normal sex, secondary sex characteristics. So just to go through the physiology, you have your gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is released by the hypothalamus and stimulates the anterior pituitary to produce your, so you, your follicle your stimulating not, hormone. Sorry, doctor, thank you. your slides are not moving, I think. Um, is it moving now? No, they are not. They still sit on here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that is it switching now? Okay, so you have your gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is released by the hypothalamus and stimulates the anterior pituitary to produce and release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. In the testes, luteinizing hormone stimulates steroidogenesis within the Leydig cells by inducing mitochondrial conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone and testosterone. So testosterone, the normal pro uh, production is about five, uh, five grams a day. Testosterone is metabolized into two major active metabolite, metabolites in the target tissue, your dihydrotestosterone from the action of 5-alpha reductase and estrogen estradiol through the action of aromatase. Dihydrotestosterone uh, is more pot a more potent, potent androgen than, than testosterone. Most peripheral target tissues require testosterone reduction to dihydrotestosterone for androgen action, but in the testis and skeletal muscle, 
conversion to dihydrotestosterone is not essential for hormone activity. It is responsible for virilizing and anabolic effects. It is metabolized by the liver and excreted in bile and urine. This is just a slide showing the conversion of cholesterol to testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. So the role of testosterone is uh, for the development of your reproductive organs, for puberty, fertility, sexual function, muscle formation, body composition, bone mineralization, and fat metabolism and sexual functions. It uh, is found in the body in bioavailable and biounavailable forms. Um, when it is bound to albumin and free, it is bioavailable. And uh, when it is bound to sex hormone binding globulin, which is majority of the testosterone, it is unavailable due to the high affinity of uh, the testosterone binding to your sex hormone binding globulin. Um, during, uh, so the levels fluctuate dramatically during life. Uh, and there are three um, may, uh, peaks. Um, the first is uh, at 12 to 18 weeks of gestation which uh, correlates to um, the uh, um, reproductive tract uh, development. The second peak is within uh, two months of age. So we can see on the table here in the neonatal period at two months of age. Um, and that is during imprinting of androgen dependent target tissues. The third peak is during the second decade of life and this cor corresponds with puberty. There's then a plateau and eventual decline with senescence. There is a seasonal variation with your testosterone being high in spring. It follows the circadian rhythm with the levels being high in the morning. And there's also hourly variations as the, gra the little graphs seen on top. Um, hypogonadism can be classified as either primary or secondary. Primary is due to testicular pathology resulting in hypogonadism. And these are some of the organic causes which uh, need to be investigated for and excluded by prior to diagnosing late onset hypogonadism. Your secondary uh, hypogonadism is due, usually due to pathology arising in the hypothalamus and anterior, anterior pituitary. For late onset hypogonadism, the pathophysiology is caused by the degeneration of germinal epithelium and increased proportion of connective epithelium in the, tissue, in the testes. Normal number of later, the total number of later cells and sertoli cells decrease, and uh, usually with an increase in gonadotropin secretion to compensate. There is a decrease in serum testosterone by one to two percent per year from the age of forty. There is also an increase in your sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, factors such as weight gain, chronic illnesses, and medications also cause testosterone suppression. Conditions that are associated with low testosterone include type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, uh, moderate to severe uh, COPD, chronic kidney disease, HIV, HIV with sarcopenia. Uh, certain medications also reduce your serum testosterone. These include corticosteroids, opioids, and antipsychotics. Alcohol with liver disease is also associated with a low serum testosterone, as well as can cannabis use and osteoporosis. Um, patients um, usually uh, complain of sexual or non-sexual symptoms. Uh, majority of the patients will come in complaining of sexual symptoms, uh, which include lessened sexual thoughts, weakened morning erections, and erectile dysfunction. The non-sexual symptoms are usually vague and non-specific and include things like hot flushes, changes in mood, fatigue, anger, sleep disturbances, depression, and diminished cognitive function. There are many um, symptom scores. Uh, the three main ones are your aging male symptom score, your androgen deficiency in aging men, and Massachusetts male aging study. Um, these symptom scores can't be used for diagnosis due to their low specificity, but can be used to assess the presence and monitoring of symptoms as well as their response to treatment. Um, in an aging male, uh, in the European aging male study, um, it demonstrated that there was a correlation between your sexual symptoms and a low serum testosterone. Um, it is important to take a detailed medical and sexual history as well as ex exclude possible primary and secondary causes for hypogonadism. It is also important to identify diseases that are associated with low testosterone as mentioned previously. 
On examination, it is important to do a full general and genital exam, including a digital rectal exam. And the focus should be on vir viralization, BMI, waist circumference, presence of gynecomastia, the testicular size and consistency. So the EOA guidelines recommend, it's the European Uro Urology Association, um, th they recommend restricting the diagnosis of testosterone deficiency to men with persistent symptoms suggesting hypogonadism, um, to measure the testosterone level in the morning at uh, 11 o'clock, preferably in a fasting state, and to repeat the total testosterone on at least two occasions with a reliable method. Um, in addition, measuring free testosterone level in men with uh, low, uh, total testosterone levels closer to the lower normal ranges, which is between 8 and 12, and though, uh, to test for free testosterone in men with suspected or known abnormal sex hormone binding globulin levels. Um, they suggest cons uh, to consider assessing testosterone in men with diseases or on treatment in which testosterone deficiency is common, as we've mentioned with the previously, it's the sexual dysfunction, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, um, patients on treatment with uh, steroids, opioids, uh, antipsychotics, those with uh, moderate to severe COPD, uh, osteoporosis, and HIV. Um, they also suggest analyzing your luteinizing hormone and follicle simulating hormone serum levels to differentiate between primary and secondary forms of hypogonadism. The guideline actually uh, mentions that the luteinizing hormone should be measured uh, twice in a 30-day period, and if both uh, serum testosterone and luteinizing hormone are low, to do a pro prolactin level to exclude a microadenoma. There is some controversy as to what constitutes a low testosterone. In your European Association of Urology guidelines, they recommend using a cutoff of 12.1 nanomoles per liter, as this is the lower end of the two and a half percentile uh, population norms. The American Uro Urology Association focuses on the total testosterone values in which men are likely to benefit from, from treatment, and they set the lower limit, uh, the, the limit, the threshold, uh, at 10.4 nanomoles per liter. So in terms of treatment for males with comorbidities, it's best to first try lifestyle modifications such as weight loss, smoking cessation, optimizing uh, glycemic control and treating comorbidities, withdraw drugs that can impair testosterone. And the goal of treatment is to restore your testosterone level to a physiological range to provide symptomatic relief. We, so for those in which the lifestyle modifications haven't worked, um, we, uh, the indications for testosterone therapy would be the, in those males um, with low testosterone, as, with sexual dysfunction, not responding to phosphodiesterase inhibitors, those with low bone mass, um, males with low testosterone and consistent and preferably multiple signs and symptoms of hypogonadism um, in whom uh, there's been unsuccessful treatment of the obesity and comorbidities, those with hypopituitism. Um, for the uh, contraindications, so for testosterone therapy, there are some absolute contraindications. These include your prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, patients who still desire uh, fertility, um, and this is because testosterone therapy uh, causes infertility through the negative feedback. Um, patients who have poorly controlled congestive cardiac failure, um, a history of venous thromboembolism in the last six months, and a hematocrit of more than 54%. There are some um, relative contraindications um, so severe lower urinary tract symptoms, and we have a, a symptom score, which is our IPSS score, and if they have a score of more than 19, it's a relative contraindication. Um, there were numerous studies that were done which showed there was no difference in lower urinary tract symptoms 
anti-testosterone therapy. However, these trials excluded patients with uh, the IPSS score more than 19, and therefore we do not have sufficient evidence for these patients, and that's why it's a relative contraindication. Uh, other relative contraindications include uh, patients with a family history of venous thromboembolism, a borderline hematocrit between 48 and 50, and those with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the benefits of testosterone therapy um, in terms of sexual function, replacing testosterone is only beneficial in hypogonadal men. It has no uh, improvement in sexual function in eugonadal men. Um, it has shown that it improves the desire and sexual activity and is used in conjunction with a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor for erect patients with erectile dysfunction. Uh, it's shown to have increased lean body mass, reduced fat mass, improved insulin resistance, and improved bone mineral density. Uh, it has shown to improve depressive symptoms, and in terms of vitality and strength, patients were had an impre, improved distance on a six-minute walk test. Um, and it has shown to improve anemia of unknown causes. The major trial here was the testosterone trial. In terms of side effects for uh, testosterone therapy, uh, it does cause fluid retention and may cause electrolyte disturbances, polycythemia, which is more common in your uh, intramuscular preparations, liver toxicity, infertility, as uh, I said previously, due to the negative feedback. In terms of the lipid profile, there's many conflicting studies that uh, showed a whole bunch of changes on your lipogram, but it has uh, it suggest, uh, the studies suggest that it lowers your uh, HDL and increases your triglycerides. Um, it may worsen your obstructive sleep apnea. There's no evidence that testosterone therapy results in an onset of sleep apnea, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, patients uh, on CPAP combined with testosterone gel have uh, been mentioned, and there's no adverse effects, but it was small studies done. The main thing is that the obstructive sleep apnea needs to be screened for and treated prior to testosterone therapy. And then it may cause um, gynecomastia as well. There are some controversies. Um, one of them is uh, prostate cancer. So in men with low levels of testosterone, they were found to have a reduced risk of developing low and intermediate risk uh, uh, prostate cancers. But they have, but have a non-significant increased chance of developing high-grade prostate can, uh, prostate cancers. There's no uh, increased risk of developing prostate cancer uh, in hypogonadal men undergoing testosterone treatment, though. Uh, testosterone therapy may unmask an undiagnosed prostate cancer, which may be detected as an early rise in your PSA within six to nine months of treatment. Therefore, patients need to be adequately screened for prostate cancer and should be uh, excluded prior to starting testosterone therapy. So a, a digital rectal exam should be performed as well as the baseline uh, PSA level. Uh, this PSA level should be less than four uh, prior to starting treatment with a normal DRE, and the level should be less than three in men with an increased risk for, prostate, for developing prostate cancer, and this includes males who have a first degree relative with prostate cancer or those of African descent. And then according to the, uh, the European uh, Asso Urology Association guidelines, men who have been treated for low risk cancers uh, could be considered for testosterone ther uh, therapy, but this therapy can, uh, treatment can only be started a year post um, post op if they've had a radical prostatectomy with no evidence of recurrence. And the uh, PSA level should be less than 0 0.01. Um, they do, um, rec um, they, they do say that you can cautiously consider patients who have started, uh, who have been treated with external beam radiation or brachytherapy. Um, but there isn't a lot of trials and safety data available on that. In terms of uh, coronary artery disease, uh, a low testosterone and erectile dysfunction are 
individual biomarkers for cardiovascular disease and are linked with an increased cardiovascular mortality. Many of the cardiovascular risk factors are so, uh, associated with low testosterone, including diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. Testosterone therapy has been shown to improve insulin re resistance, reduce obesity, increase lean body mass, which may modify the cardiovascular risk factors. Um, in some studies, there were no increase in major adverse cardiac events with testosterone therapy. And they reported that there was an increase in cardiac ischemia, angina, and exercise ca capacity. But there are many conflicting data, uh, conflicting data in trials with regards to testosterone therapy and cardiovascular events. And there is uh, still an FDA warning on your testosterone preparations, uh, warning of an increased risk of venous thromboembolic uh, uh, disease, myocardial infarction, and stroke. When it comes to congestive cardiac failure, in severe cardiac failure, testosterone therapy is contraindicated due to the fluid retention, which may exacerbate the condition. However, untreated hypogonadism was associated with an increased readmission rate and mortality rate. Testosterone therapy in men with moderate cardiac failure, along with anti-failure treatment, has been shown to improve exercise capacity and failure symptoms, but did not uh, improve myocardial function. And if testosterone therapy is initiated in these patients, they need to be carefully followed up with clinical assessments of failure symptoms, fluid status, and hematocrit levels. Um, so there are multiple um, preparations available on the market. Um, so we're just going to quickly go through them. In terms of uh, oral preparations, we have uh, testosterone and decronate. Which is, testosterone, uh, which is testosterone esterified with long fatty acids. It's absorbed through the lymphatics, so it bypasses the first, uh, the, the first pass metabolism by the liver. It has to be taken three times a day. It depends on dietary fat uh, and has an unpredictable uh, absorption. The other preparation available is mesoterolone. It's a 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone derivative. It's not um, aromatized peripherally and is usually used for a short-term treatment of painful gynecomastia. We have then um, buccal preparations. These are mucoadhesive tablets with uh, that provide sustained release. It delivers testosterone to the systemic cir circulation bypassing the liver, has a peak onset at 10 to 12 hours, uh, and it reaches a steady state at 24 hours. On discontinuation, the levels drop within two to four hours. It mimics the circadian rhythm and has no accumulation over time. Um, it has a quick onset and offset. It has a non-invasive route of administration and has a low risk for secondary transfer. However, it does cause irritation, inflammation, and gingivitis. There are nasal sprays that are available. Um, it, the, they uh, with each actuation, it releases five milligrams um, with, um, when, uh, when delivered. Um, it's absorbed through the nasal mucosa and avoids the first pass metabolism. It's a non-invasive, a quick onset, quick offset uh, with a low risk of secondary transfers. However, it is associated with headaches, rhinorrhea, nosebleeds, sinusitis, and nasal discomfort. There are some transdermal patches that are available. Initially, the transdermal patches were um, applied to scrotal skin, but there was a difficulty in getting them to adhere. The patients needed to shave before. It caused quite a bit of skin irritation. So the new transdermal patches are applied to non-scrotal skin. It provides a sustained release over 24 hours. The patch site needs to be rotated and not reused for seven days. It has a peak onset at eight hours. It's easy to use. It has a low risk of secondary transfer, but is associated with skin blistering and irritation. There are many, many gels available, and each of them have different concentrations. Um, they basically... Um, Applied to the skin, it's absorbed by the stratum corneum and uh, develops a reservoir in the subcutaneous tissue. 
Um, dose adjustments need to be made for patients with obesity because they have altered pharmacokinetics, but it's easy to apply. There's less skin irritation than a transdermal patches, um, but they are a high risk for secondary transfer. Then there are other formulations, which is a solution that is applied to the underarms. It comes within a metered dose pump, which delivers 30 milligrams per actuation. It has a peak onset of two to four hours and reaches therapeutic range within, 24 hour, within a 24 hour period. It's easy to apply. It has a decreased risk of secondary transport when compared to the gels, but does cause uh, skin irritation as well. And then we have the intramuscular uh, formulations. It's, this is natural testosterone that is, has been esterified to increase its solubility in oil, which allows us for slower release. The testosterone est esters become biologically active once the side chain is cleaved off, and the length of the side chain correlates with the duration of action. We've got two major uh, main preparations that are available to us, which is depot testosterone and nubido. So depot testosterone or testosterone cypionate has a seven to eight carbon atoms. It's prepared in cotton seed oil. The dose is 50 to 400 milligrams intramuscularly, two to four weekly. Um, during, uh, during the treatment period, there's fluctuating, fluctuating levels of testosterone. And this is then associated with uh, fluctuations in mood and libido. Um, it's contraindicated in patients who have a known hypersensitivity to soy. Its advantage, though, is that it, it, it allows for less frequent dosing. And then um, other disadvantages, uh, other than the fluctuation in mood and libido, include uh, inflammation and pain at the injection site. And, uh, the IM preparations are uh, more strongly associated with the development of polycythemia than the other preparations. We have testosterone undergonate or nibido, and this is a slightly longer acting. Uh, it is um, testosterone esterified and, and joined to like 11, 11 carbon atoms. It's prepared in refined castor oil. The dose is 1,000 milligrams which is given as a stat dose and then repeated at six weeks and then dosed every 10 to 14 weekly. The serum levels peak at day seven post administration. The levels are checked prior to administration of the next dose. Um, it allows for less frequent dosing intervals. The disadvantages, there may be pain and inflammation at the injection site. There may be a development of acne. Uh, again, it's associated with polycythemia. Um, patients may develop anaphylaxis or a pulmonary oil microembolism. So these patients, when they receive the nibido, need to be monitored for at least 30 minutes post-administration. There are crystalline testosterone preparations which come in implantable pellets. Each pellet um, contains 25 milligrams of testosterone, and the dose here is 150 to 450 milligrams, which is um, inserted subcutaneously and then dosed three to six monthly. The levels are monitored at two to four weeks post implantation, and then a, a 12 week check is done, at, or testosterone level is done to see if a repeat dosing is needed. It has a, a long duration of action. However, it does require a procedure and it is difficult to withdraw should adverse events occur. Um, some uh, so some adverse events associated with the pellets include pain at the site, extrusion or migration of the pellets, infection and hematoma at the site of implantation. So for males who desire fertility, um, there are other options available. These include your gonadotropins, so your human chorionic gonadotropins uh, in combination with your follicle stimulating hormones, or your um, anti estrogens, so your selective estrogen receptor modulators such as clomiphene, or your aromatase inhibitors such as aromatase. However, the clomiphene is also associated with the polycythemia and increased risk of venous thromboembolic phenomenon. And your um 
is associated with worsening of osteoporosis. So the, recommend, the EUA rec, uh, guideline recommendations for testosterone re, uh, replacement therapies if to fully inform the patient about the expected benefits and side effects of the treatment and select a preparation in joint decision with, your, with the informed patient and physician to use short acting preparations rather than long acting uh, preparations when starting treat, initial treatment so the therapy can be adjusted or stopped in the case of adverse effects and then not to use your testosterone therapy in uh, males um, that uh, desire fertility as testosterone therapy may suppress your spermatogenesis. And then when, you, when using your gonadotropins to use your human chorionic gonadotropin treatment in hypogonadal patients with simultaneous fertility treatment, and then in patients with, late, with adult onset hypogonadism, only prescribe testosterone treatment in men with multiple symptoms if lifestyle modifications, weight loss have failed. So for the follow-up of these patients, the testosterone uh, levels, uh, the interval for checking these levels is based on the, proper, uh, the preparation being used. And the aim is to achieve a mid-normal range. There is no added benefit to giving the, uh, to uh, replacing to a supra-physiological range. Uh, then to evaluate for symptom regression. And if there is no symptom regression, to withdraw treatment at six months. Um, you're going to follow up the serum testosterone uh, levels at three, six, and 12-month intervals uh, once you've uh, reached your uh, desired level and they after annually. Your, for bone density, it sh, uh, the bone density should be assessed prior to treatment. Improvement is detectable at six months and repeat assessment is done at 18 months. Um, the hematocrit should be assessed prior to treatment. A raise in hematocrit may become evident at three months post initiation of, three, uh, of treatment, and it peaks at 12 months. So the hematocrit is uh, checked at three, six, and 12 month, month intervals and thereafter annually. Uh, in terms of uh, prostate follow up, Prior to initiation, a uh, digital rectal exam should be done as well as a, pros a PSA, prostate volume. And the PSA should then be repeated at three, six, and 12 months post initiation of therapy. Testosterone therapy may unmask an undiagnosed prostate cancer. So if there is a substantial rise or continued rise in PSA, um, prostate cancer needs to be investigated and excluded. For cardiovascular uh, monitoring, um, the testosterone therapy should be used in caution with men with pre-existing cardiac failure. Careful clinical assessment of patients, the patient's condition and hematocrit and measurements sh uh, should be done on a regular basis. And then at the bottom there, I've just included the follow-up recommendations from the EUA guidelines, which is basically what we have said. And these are my references. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Hello. Hi, yes, Dr. Bila. Hi, uh, so Dr. Zaki, I've been, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. You, you can handle the questions because I've been in and out because of load shading. I've been having challenges. You're done. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I'm sure about this. I've, I've got load shading. So I've been in and out. I'm sure there was a time when... Um, thanks, thanks, colleagues. I'm not sure if there are any questions uh, for Dr. Zaki. Uh, Gabe, if anyone has got a question, Dr. Gabe. I can't see question because I'm using my cell phone to, to connect. Uh, Are you able to read any questions on the ch chat line there, Dr. Kim? I don't see any for now. Yeah, okay. at, the, at the beginning you spoke about uh, one of the symptoms that you were saying that the, 
uh, you see p- people, p- patients present with, high, with uh, hot flushes. And I know that when you're preparing this presentation, you spoke about that this is a, a male menopause. Male menopause. Yeah. So how, how are you making that association between that? Because are, uh, hot flushes are mainly associated with women, if I pardon my... Yeah. my yeah, no, it's associated in with uh, hypogonadism as well, um, especially our patients that are on androgen de- deprivation therapy. Those that are pros- on pro- uh, that have prostate cancer, their most frequent com- and distressing complaint is the hot flushes. And for the same reason that you said, it's like I'm sweating like my wife. <laughs> yeah, is what they come and tell you. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question here by Dr. Mashiro. He says, can you comment on compensated hypogonadism and when to make the diagnosis? So for specifically late onset hypogonadism, you you have, it's based on symptoms as well as the serum level of testosterone. So if they are asymptomatic, they don't require uh, further um, they don't require replacement. So okay. you, you don't need to investigate it further if the patient is asymptomatic. Okay. And uh, Dr. Shimange wants to know, um, what about calling the condition andropos? Uh, well, you, so we, we spoke about got, of- Yeah, it's actually had uh, many names. So andropos, one of them, male menopause, um, Many it can, there's many names that they previously were calling it, but the EUA guidelines has settled on late onset hypogonadism. Okay, so Andropos is one of the other alternative uh, uh, yeah. alternative names. Yes. Okay, in 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 in, 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 in our clinical settings, say Prisani Baira, how many? Or Shelley Joseph, but I I assume quite a number of cases. Where patients present with this or uh, uh, presenting as as purely because of the symptoms of uh, uh, sexual yeah. conditions, yeah. is that what you yeah. find? Main, mainly, they come in complaining of sexual uh, uh, of the sexual symptoms, decreased desire, decreased de- libido, and is then found on investigation of those symptoms. And. Um, how, how many of these patients that you are seeing or, or when you've got patients presenting with hypogonadism of sexual conditions, uh, um, like we, we, you put them on long-term medication? Um, so I think it's underdiagnosed in our setting uh, or under-referred. Um, we, uh, not a large amount of patients in our clinic um, but um, I mean, there has been um, European number uh, like guidelines, and everything is based on the guidelines. But their prevalence was as high as twenty three point three percent. Okay, mm. so, so there's a question That's, that has been yeah. sent to to us directly. Uh, if you could comment on 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 the behavior changes associated with testosterone supplementation such as aggression and the mechanism thereof? So those uh, symptoms are usually um, associated with with, um, steroid abuse, and it's usually in patients who have um, more more than the physiological level of testosterone. Uh, Replacing it to your physiological level, I don't think would be associated with aggression. Yes. So not much of that that you you, you found out. Not that we've seen. And how many cases that you find are referred to you uh, who are not coming directly to you because of they may not have complained of the symptoms, but they've either seen a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist and they end up being referred to you for further investigation? Um, they usually... So they usually... 
we haven't seen anyone referred in terms of, well i haven't seen anyone referred from a psychologist or psychiatrist but the, a lot of clinic referrals the would just send them with the referral note saying erectile dysfunction um mainly it's uh, the local clinic referrals we we, we okay. pick it up so they, they so they do come with the erectile dysfunction most of them Erectile dysfunction yeah. or decreased libido, yeah. Okay. I don't see any further questions on the on the chat line. I don't know if there are. If there's, if there's anyone who has a question, perhaps they could just uh, unmute themselves and just uh, pose a question uh, for Dr. Gaby. Okay, no, no, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Gaby, and, and also we wish you well in your studies. Uh, uh, just before we leave, uh, someone says Dr. Abraham wants to know, does uh, exercise uh, increase testosterone? The, maybe the benefits associated with the exercise, so the weight loss and increased uh, muscle bulk that will be associated with an increase in testosterone, uh, not really just the exercise on its own. So, so weight loss has, has, has an impact in that? Weight loss, definitely, yes. Okay. Okay, no, um, say some Dr. Van der Hossi's excellent presentation. Many thanks. Okay. And I think um, you'll find that quite a number of people in this uh, webinar do also uh, appreciate the presentation that have been presented by speakers who have spoken to us on a variety of topics. And uh, Dr. Mashir wants to know, anabolic induced hypogonadism, is it because of uh, isoma or testosterone itself? Um, so it's it's linked to the negative feedback and the decrease in your uh, gonadotropins, your luteinizing hormone and your follicle stimulating hormone, as well as the changes that they produce uh, on the testes themselves um, because of the decrease in your luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, and that's that that's more the mechanism for. Your, uh, your anabolic uh, induced hypogonadism. Okay. No, no, yeah. thanks a lot. Uh, we're still getting some uh, more you. compliments. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much for the op opportunity. I appreciate it. Yeah. No, no, we, we just want to thank you and also to uh, thank uh, Professor Adam uh, uh, for, for making you available uh, That and also that wish you all the best in your studies that we Hope that uh, we'll hear more from you in the future as a urologist. And uh, thanks for this time. And also uh, just want to thank all the colleagues who have uh, logged in uh, week in and week out uh, to these presentations. And also just want to apologize that we were only able to send out the invitations this morning. Uh, but there were some uh, uh, logistical challenges that we had. The past two weeks have been quite a challenge with many uh, 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 holidays in between, so that made it a bit difficult to organize these uh, webinars. But you're back on track next week, uh, so colleagues, please do join us next week. Uh, we will have a special session to dedicate it to the nursing fraternity, and we've got quite speakers who are lined up to talk to us next week, and so we'd love to welcome you once more again next week, and also to thank uh, uh, from our team, at, uh, marketing team, Zoki, who's with us uh, tonight and also Kamu and talk have been quite uh, supportive of these webinars. We just want to thank them and from the leadership of Clinics Health Group and in particular Dr. Kinoshi who's been working hard with us uh, as we put this presentation together. And thank you very much, Dr. Zakia, uh, uh, Gaby. And we hope to see all of you again next to colleagues and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.